welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern. Today is December 31st, New Year's Eve, and we are a day away from 2019. I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas and enjoyed the Christmas-themed poems that we brought to you last week. And thanks to Andrew Kern, to my dad, for filling in for me on Friday with his reading of The Gift of the Magi. We will be bringing you a couple more Christmas-themed poems uh, up through the 12 days of Christmas. But today and tomorrow, I've got a couple of New Year's-themed poems for you. The poem I'm going to read today is by W.H. Auden, who lived from 1907 to 1973. You've heard from him a time or two on this podcast. The poem is called For the Time Being, or rather it's from a poem called For the Time Being. For the Time Being is actually quite a long poem. This is just a selection from For the Time Being that is related to the end of Christmas and the beginning of a new year. Interestingly, Auden wrote this poem to be set to music by Benjamin Britten, which I did not know until I was looking up some things uh, for this podcast. That's very interesting. But the poem is a series of dramatic monologues spoken by the characters in the Christmas story and by choruses and a narrator. And and he, he made all the characters speak in sort of a modern fashion, a modern way of speaking. So uh, here is the selection that has to do with the new year, I believe. Well, so that is that. Now we must dismantle the tree, putting the decorations back into their cardboard boxes, some have got broken, and carrying them up to the attic. The holly and the mistletoe must be taken down and burnt, and the children got ready for school. There are enough leftovers to do warmed up for the rest of the week. Not that we have much appetite, having drunk such a lot. Stayed up so late, attempted quite unsuccessfully to love all of our relatives, and in general, grossly overestimated our powers. Once again, as in previous years, we have seen the actual vision and failed to do more than entertain it as an agreeable possibility. Once again, we have sent him away, begging, though, to remain his disobedient servant, the promising child who cannot keep his word for long. The Christmas feast is already a fading memory, and already the mind begins to be vaguely aware of an unpleasant whiff of apprehension at the thought of Lent and Good Friday, which cannot, after all, now be very far off. But for the time being, here we all are, back in the moderate Aristotelian city of Darning in the 815, where Euclid's geometry and Newton's mechanics would account for our experience, and the kitchen table exists because I scrub it. It seems to have shrunk during the holidays. The streets are much narrower than we remembered. We had forgotten the office was as depressing as this. To those who have seen the child, however dimly, However incredulously, the time being is, in a sense, the most trying time of all. For the innocent children who whispered so excitedly outside the locked door where they knew the presence to be grew up when it opened. Now, recollecting that moment, we can repress the joy, but the guilt remains conscious. Remembering the stable where, for once in our lives, everything became a you and nothing was an it. And craving the sensation but ignoring the cause, we look round for something, no matter what, to inhibit our self-reflection, and the obvious thing for that purpose would be some great suffering. So once we have met the Son, we are tempted ever to pray to the Father, lead us into temptation and evil for our sake. They will come all right, don't worry, probably in a form that we do not expect, and certainly with a force more dreadful than we can imagine. In the meantime, there are bills to be paid, machines to keep in repair, irregular verbs to learn, the time being to redeem from insignificance. The happy morning is over. The night of agony is still to come. The time is noon, when the spirit must practice his scales of rejoicing without even a hostile audience, and the soul endure a silence that is neither for nor against her faith that God's will will be done, that in spite of her prayers, God will cheat no one, not even the world of its triumph. Like all of Alden's work, there's a lot going on here. It's a, it's a fairly lengthy uh, selection from a long poem, and it's impossible to unpack everything that's going on in this, you know, this one podcast in just a couple minutes of description. But one thing that's true of this poem, like all of Alden's greatest work, is there is a, a drive, an energy, a, a forward motion that his language offers. Um, there's, a, there's a rhythm to it and an energy to it that is sort of unmistakably Alden's own. Um, it's, it's remarkable how the great poets manage to capture uh, their own voice so completely when they're, when they're writing their poems, and especially when they're at the peak of their powers. 
you see it in Frost for sure. Someone like Elizabeth Bishop, I think you see it. Dickinson, you uh, absolutely see it. Um, and we see it here and out and there's a sort of herky jerkiness to it in some ways, into even in the way the lines are presented visually. But it's that sort of herky jerkiness and the way that it forces you to to enter into its sort of in, into its patterns is what offers that flow. So when you settle into it as a reader, uh, especially when you're reading aloud, it offers that that flow. And I think that part of that energy is a true sense of contemplation. It takes you from one thought to another. There's this sense of association that's happening here between between the ideas. Um, he can move from very specific examples of things into extremely deep philosophical thought, deeply spiritual thought. And it's because his voice enables the uh, the echoes of the various things that he's associating. And that's, you know, one of the things that makes his work so truly poetic and so valuable, I think, for our culture. It's certainly deeply modern, but it's modern in a way it speaks to us and for us and, and about us, but not in a way that is um, demeaning or even in a way that is buying into the age, if that makes sense. It can speak to the age and for the age without being of the age in some, in some ways, I think. It's a, I'm not sure exactly how to express that, that idea fully in, in about three minutes. But as I read this again, I, you know, there's a lot of ideas here about the new year and, and, and a lot of spiritual um, ideas to, to grapple with and think about and, and, and a lot of contemplation. But I think, you know, I, I hope you'll take a look at the way his language has this energy to it that allows that contemplation as, as he goes from one idea to the next so freely, but with an elegance that, that keeps it from being uh, sort of nonsensical, like, like the worst poetry can come across. Um, so that, and that, that's what makes Auden Auden. So here it is again from For the Time Being. Well, so that is that. Now we must dismantle the tree putting the decorations back into their cardboard boxes some have got broken and carrying them up to the attic the holly and the mistletoe must be taken down and burnt and the children got ready for school there are enough leftovers to do warmed up for the rest of the week not that we have much appetite having drunk such a lot stayed up so late attempted quite unsuccessfully to love all of our relatives and in general grossly overestimated our powers once again, as in previous years, we have seen the actual vision and failed to do more than entertain it as an agreeable possibility. Once again, we have sent him away, begging, though, to remain his disobedient servant, the promising child who cannot keep his word for long. The Christmas feast is already a fading memory, and already the mind begins to be vaguely aware of an unpleasant whiff of apprehension at the thought of Lent and Good Friday, which cannot, after all, now be very far off. But for the time being, here we all are, back in the moderate Aristotelian city of Darning in the 815, where Euclid's geometry and Newton's mechanics would account for our experience, and the kitchen table exists because I scrub it. It seems to have shrunk during the holidays. The streets are much narrower than we remembered. We had forgotten the office was as depressing as this. To those who have seen the child, however dimly, however incredulously, the time being is, in a sense, the most trying time of all. For the innocent children who whispered so excitedly outside the locked door where they knew the presence to be grew up when it opened. Now, recollecting that moment, we can repress the joy, but the guilt remains conscious. Remembering the stable where for once in our lives everything became a you and nothing was an it. And craving the sensation but ignoring the cause, we look round for something, no matter what, to inhibit our self-reflection. And the obvious thing for that purpose would be some great suffering. So once we have met the Son, we are tempted ever after to pray to the Father. Lead us into temptation and evil for our sake. They will come all right, don't worry. Probably in a form that we do not expect, and certainly with a force more dreadful than we can imagine. In the meantime, there are bills to be paid, machines to keep in repair, irregular verbs to learn, the time being to redeem from insignificance. The happy morning is over, the night of agony still to come. The time is noon when the spirit must practice his scales of rejoicing without even a hostile audience, and the soul endure a silence that is neither for nor against her faith that God's will will be done, that in spite of her prayers, God will cheat no one, not even the world of its triumph. This has been The Daily Poem. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back with another episode tomorrow.